You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello and welcome to Garibaldi Red, the Nottingham Forest podcast on Nottinghamshire Live. My name is Matt Davis and I'm joined today by Red's correspondent Sarah Clapson. Sarah, hello, how are you? Hello, I'm very well, how are you? I'm fine and I'll be in the interest of full disclosure, this is the second time we've done this because the first recording didn't save. So Sarah, <laughs> I thank you for your patience to go through this all again, it's very good of you. Um, let's start with uh, something a bit different and an exciting development for the podcast in that we now have our own Twitter account. So we're going to plug that first of all, so people know it's happening. And it is, I'll put the overlay on here, at Garibaldi Red underscore. So give us a follow on Twitter and we'll put our best clips and upcoming news and everything associated with the podcast on there. So give that a follow if you'd be so kind. And at the end of this, give us a good rating and a good review on iTunes because we're recording this twice because we love it so much. <laughs> Sarah, um, you went to Crewe on Saturday as Forrest drew 2-2 to lose their unbeaten record in pre-season, if that actually means anything. Um, what are your thoughts on the game and, and who stood out for you? Yeah, it was more of a test than Forrest have had so far in their pre-season games. Um, for the most part, they did pretty well. They um, had a decent first half, looked really good going forward. Um, it all kind of fell apart a little bit in the last... 15 minutes or so after they'd made a lot of changes, brought a, a, a lot of fresh faces on, they just lost their way a little bit, Forrest and crew got back into it uh, and then obviously equalised. But there were some decent individual performances in there. Um, Brennan Johnson obviously stood out with his two goals. We're going to give him the first one, albeit there was a, a bit of debate about whether it was an own goal or not, but we'll give it to him so that he's got two. Um, he had an, an all-round very good game. Um, Jack Colback did very well in midfield. Um and Joe Lolly looked like he was back to his old self, which is um, which is a good sign going into the new season. He seems to have found a bit of form, and I, I guess we can roll out that old cliche of it being almost like a new signing because he he'd had a, a tough time of it last year. So good to see him back to um, somewhere near his best, and hopefully he can keep that going. Just uh, uh, Forrest got a little bit sloppy towards the end, which is something they'll they'll have to work on because you can't have that in the the championship if they um, switch off like that then they're going to get punished even more than they, they did at Crew on Saturday. So plenty still for Chris Uton to work on. Um, two more friendlies to go. Uh, the new season is, is coming around pretty fast. There's some positives there. Um, but nobody's going to hit their top form in the first game. Chris Uton made that point afterwards that you don't want to be at your peak in the first game of the season. Um, you don't want it to all go downhill after that. You need to build up steadily. So... It's about making. It's about timing, really, making sure Forest are, are, are right for that first game against Coventry and keep building from there. There's a lot still to improve on. Um, they do need to get better, but there is a good base there. Um, there are some players starting to find a bit of form, which is good. Just on Brennan, then. I mean, he played number ten, um, which is in an impossible in the case where he might feature for Forest in the first team if he's at the club, because um, there's. Obvious interest from Brentford, you've reported before they had a bid rejected. And are you expecting a second bid? And what might Forrest be able to do to fend Brentford off this time? <laughs> um, I, I do think Brentford will probably come back in for him. And he does have interest from elsewhere, um, understandably, because he had a great season for Lincoln. He's a young player with a lot of potential. He looks to have a very bright future ahead of him attacking players of that kind of calibre uh, are always going to attract interest. They're, they're the kind of players that everybody wants. And that's why I hope Forrest hang on to him, really, um, because he would be very difficult to replace. We've kind of seen it in the past before when when Forrest have let players like, uh, I guess, your Oliver Burks, your Arvin Apayas go. Players that were of a young age looked like they had bright futures ahead of them and we never really got to see the best of them at Forest because they left very early um, bringing in attacking players or finding attacking players is difficult, Forest do need to do that so to lose one if they let Bron and Johnson go I think that would be a, a that would put them even further back um, I'd be doing everything I could to hang on to them and to hang on to him I should say if I was Forrest, um, there is talk of them offering him a new deal so that he's tied down for longer and that Forrest are in a, a better position. Hopefully that would fend off a few of his um, potential suitors. I do think Forrest will have their resolve tested again because clubs are looking. 
they do want that kind of player. Um, the market is very difficult for everybody. So I think Forrest might have to um, fend off whether it be Brentford or, or somebody else again. But hopefully they do because I really think Brennan Johnson can have a big part to play this season. I think he can be a, a huge player for Forrest. You mentioned Interestingly, there are players like Burke, Apaya, Cash, Brerett. And I think the consensus would be that Forrest got good deals for all of them. Mm, yeah. It's a, a bit of a test for Dane Murphy now in terms of what he can do. I mean, what 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 is an, a, a, a sum that Forrest couldn't turn down, do we think, for Brennan Johnson? I think Brennan Johnson's still a, a young player. He still hasn't proved himself at um, championship level so you have to take that into account when you're you're looking at any potential bids um Forrest will certainly want to uh, as you mentioned they they have never let players go really without making sure they get good money for them and getting good clauses and good sell-ons um, inserted into any contract as well so that they're set up further down the line as well um I think if you're you're if you're Brennan Johnson, somewhere around eight, ten million, that is really good money for for someone like him, um, who I say hasn't proven himself yet at championship level. If anybody came in with that kind of level, I think that would be very tough for Forrest to turn down. Um, but you, you know it, that depends on somebody putting money on the table of, of that level, and um, and Forrest. Dave Murphy maybe um, having a say in what happens. He has he did mention on Friday, Dave Murphy, that he expects some players to leave to make sh- um, a bit of room in the squad. And um, we know there's players that are, are out of favour, but also to free up a bit of funds. Um, Forest do need to get players in, and if they they're going to go on a, a bit of a spending mission, I think they could well do with freeing up some money first. Um, that's not to say that. That they're completely reliant on that because I think they'll also look at loans and um, and free transfers as well. Um, but I think if they're, they're wanting to spend a bit of money, then they might have to free up a bit of cash to enable them to do that. I don't know if you can hear the hoover in the background. It sums up the <laughs> gone this week, but we'll, we'll plow on. We'll plow on quickly. Um, the other big transfer story of the week because Forest do need players, is Lee Buchanan, a very cheeky, tremendous offer <laughs> for Derby's uh, left-back. What's the latest on, on that one? How do you think it might develop? <laughs> well, Derby um, quickly tried to uh, to stop that in its tracks. Um, from what we understand, Forrest's bid was uh, of an in- initial £1 million, perhaps rising to more than that. Um, Derby seemed to rate him as being worth a few million more. Um, whether Forrest are prepared to stretch to that, I'm not so sure. He's a a good young player. He's got a lot of experience. He's highly rated by Rooney. Um, and to that extent, Derby sound like they're pretty keen to hang on to him if they can, um, not least because they um, are struggling for players. So I'm sure they, they wouldn't really want to let him go. But Forrest aren't the only ones interested. Um, th- there's talk of Celtic taking a look at him today. Um <laughs> Forest need a left back desperately, uh, and I think they'll. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they try and and see if they can do a bit more dealing on on that front. Maybe go in and and see what it's like. But they need to get someone in pretty quickly. Um, Tyler Blackett's out for probably a month, three or four weeks, and then he's going to have to build up his fitness again. He's missed a lot of pre season, so he's going to be a little bit behind. <laughs> Forest don't really have too many other options. Gate and Bong came in from the cold on Saturday. He was one of the players that was told they were free to move on this summer, but there's been a little bit of backtracking once Forest realised they were really short of options on Saturday. And um, he was on the bench, came off um, or came on the pitch, I should say, for the last, I think it was 15 minutes or so. Um, Jaden Richardson has played there um, when Tyler Blackett hasn't been involved previously. Um, but he's a very young, inexperienced player, and I'm not so sure that Forrest would want to go into the season with him really as the the only option. Um, I think that's why Chris Hutton tried lower Combeso there on Saturday at left back. He did okay, and Beso, but I think it was pretty clear that that's not his favoured position. He is a centre back, and you could see that it was a a centre back playing at a at full back. He was very good defensively, but getting forward getting crosses in, that's not his strength. And that's a key part of how Forrest play. Um, 
you need somebody who's going to be able to offer you an attacking outlet who's going to be able to bomb on down that that flank and put balls into the box. I'm not so sure that's Mbeso's, um that's not what he's good at really. So Forrest desperately needs somebody in at left back. What did you make of Murphy then and what do you think might happen in the next week or so around transfers? I know it's difficult to say and it, you know anything can happen, but what are your thoughts on that and your interview with Dane Murphy? Yeah, he was very impressive. Um, he gave a, a really good, positive first impression. Um, it was nice to to speak to someone of the forest hierarchy. I should say that's something that we've asked for for quite a long time, and um, yep, that we was allowed to speak to the new CEO, um, which was great. He is um, a, a young man who is very eloquent, clearly very clever, um, has a clear vision and a plan for what he wants at Forest. He set that out um, very clearly. I think it's just a case of giving him time. Um, He was very realistic in setting out his ambitions. Everybody knows that the ultimate goal is to get Forrest in the Premier League, but Dane Murphy didn't want to put any kind of time frame on that, um, which I think is, is quite good if you set out if you say if you come in and say, "Oh, we want to get to the Premier League this season or next season," then you know that can quickly um, can quickly work against you, and it, it does put the pressure on. He's very realistic, I think, in in that he knows it will take time. It's about things coming together. Um, he, he he's keen to work with Chris Hutton and make sure there's that relationship there. He set out his kind of transfer strategy and his his plan for signings. I think the club will go down a bit of a different path than they have done previously. Um, He's talked before at Barnsley and and again since he joined about looking at younger players and trying to find players that your rivals aren't looking at. So you're finding these hidden gems that you can maybe get for a bit less money because there's less competition. Um, And you're, you're looking at different ways of doing things. His point was that if everybody does the same thing goes off the goes after the same kind of players then you're just going to end up in the middle of the road and and that's not what Forest want they want to be up that top end of the table and to do that they're they're trying different ideas and um, different ways of looking at things and I I think that can be a good thing it's um, the real test then is what happens on the pitch and and that kind of stability behind the scenes but in Dane Murphy it seems like they've they've got someone with a good head on their shoulders and he's highly rated he's um, He's someone that gave a very good impression. Well, Sarah, it's been a pleasure again. So thank you very <laughs> much for, for that. I'm not sure if it was better first or second time around, but <laughs> no, no, don't worry. We're very grateful. Um, and we appreciate you coming back on again. Um, stay with us, everyone uh, who's listening, and we'll have an interview with Mark Crossley about what he's up to today. Um, walking is brilliant and a lot around mental health, which is very interesting. I recorded that earlier, so it's well worth a listen to. And we shall catch up with Sarah and everyone else next week. Oh, it's in my cup someone sent me. <laughs> Spot on. Who sent you that? Some guy who just does the merchandising stuff on uh, social media said, would you like one of these? I went, yeah, go on then. <laughs> <laughs> out for now, out for now, to us up here in Barnsley, mate. Out for now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to be joined by Red's great Mark Crossley to talk all things uh, Forest and what he's up to these days of walking. In bri- walking is brilliant. Mark, good morning. How are you? Uh, I'm okay now. I've recovered from uh, from COVID. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm back in the game, as I say. Yeah, yeah. It knocked you about by the sound of it. You were saying before we started recording. It did. Yeah. Um, I picked. I actually got the symptoms on the walk, uh, but I just thought it was pure. We did a walk, obviously, coast to coast, and I got symptoms then. But I just thought it was a pure heat exhaustion, that, that, and until I got back and did the test and. Yeah, but it's not. Yeah, it's not. It's not knocked a little bit at me, to be honest. I bet. I bet. And we will talk a lot more about walking is brilliant. What you're up to shortly. Um, just on your old club, Forest, then, and what what's happening at the, at the moment. The only player they've signed is a goalkeeper, so you're well placed to talk about that. In Ethan Horvath, who was in America recently. Do you? How important is it? Do you think that Brees Samba has proper competition because uh, and someone who can really push him all the way in your experience as a keeper? For me, it's massive. For me, it used to bring the best out of me. Um, if you knew he didn't have too much competition behind you, 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 you do kind of take it for granted, thinking, oh, well, I'm going to play next week. So, the, yeah, I think it's really, really important because 
Bryce Sanders is such a laid back character. He, he looks like the type that needs needs pushing. Um, so yeah, be good. Uh, you can't beat competition, you know, and you, you know as a goalkeeper when you're out of form, um, that the more you get in push from someone from behind, it's uh, behind you. It, it brings the best out of you. So I think it's been a very very important first signing. What was your kind of relationship like with the other keeper in the squad when you were at Forest or Middlesbrough or wherever? Did you get on, or was there real, you know, competition to? I, I do see, up? I do see a lot of clubs these days where goalkeepers they're all we're all we're part of the goalkeepers union, and, and and I get that. But for me, he wants my job. So someone that wants my job, I can't get too close to. Um, that's just the way I looked at it. You know, I've got somebody. Uh, who is kind of got a say on my career, really. So, although I would get on with them reasonably well, I wouldn't be sharing a car, put it that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> Forrest, uh, three games into pre-season now, two wins and one draw. They drew a crew on Saturday. I mean, what do results, do results really matter from, your, from when you were playing and coaching? Were you that bothered about pre-season results? You'll get a lot of managers saying the results don't matter, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the opposite. I've got to be honest. I think winning games breeds confidence. We all know how important it is that a team starts well uh, in a new campaign. It's really, really important that you start well because building momentum is the key to the, to the long season ahead. So I think pre-season is really important, not only for, for fitness and sharpness and and team bonding and getting to know strengths and weaknesses of new signings usually that come. Um, it's really important. And results, you can't beat winning games of football for me, you know. So I, if I was manager, I would be saying, you know, all these import, the, all these pre-season games are important and, and it's about winning and it's about building momentum going into a, 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 another tough season. I guess pre-seasons have evolved now in terms of how clubs go about them in training. Can you give us some insight into what your pre-seasons were like at, at Forest? You played for different gaffers, including the gaffer, but what was it like when you were playing? Uh, as time as time went on, uh, different training methods uh, came in. So, for instance, we, would, we wouldn't see a ball for two weeks. We'd be running, we'd be getting our fitness levels up, but you'd usually go away after a season and you'd probably put about half a stone on in weight because you'd be told to relax and enjoy the break. These days, you get a couple, week, couple of weeks where you're told not to do anything and then you get sent a, a programme to start building back up into a tough pre-season. And I think things tend to be a lot shorter these days. There's not so much running around lakes. You get the odd days where you'll go do a little bit of hill running and stuff like that. But in general, with the new training methods, it's all about getting your heart rate up, <clears throat> sustaining that heart rate, not going above it. And also not dropping below it, so <clears throat> that's the way forward on on the mechanics of pre-season and getting your fitness and sustaining a fitness level. But back when we were playing, we used to do a lot of days at Wollaton Park, um, up the hills, round the lake, and it wasn't to, it wasn't um, as though it was planned. It would be right. We'll do one more, or we'll do five more, or we got ten more of these to do. We just kept going until you actually felt sick. <laughs> Where were you in that as a goalie? Was was Brian Clough bothered if you were at the back or not? I think it was more of a case of just get through it, uh, so long as you do it all. So I was a bit of a plodder, so I was never up near the front, but I was kind of in the middle to, and towards the back. But I just I just used to plod through the short stuff. I was no good at, but the long stuff I wasn't too bad. I was uh, a plodder, as uh, so they say. Um. As it stands, Forest have only signed Horvath, as we say. I mean, that might change through through the week. Fans are a bit restless about the lack of signings and the lack of depth mm. in the squad. There's still a few weeks left in the window. How do you see it as a former player? Are you a bit worried that they've not got many in yet? Well, it's always nice to get your signings in early doors. And and, and Chris Hewitt will definitely have his targets. He'll, 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 there'll be some gone by the wayside. Uh, and there'll be some targets that are still there. Unfortunately, these days... Deals can't get done very quickly, simply because agents are involved, transfer fees, 
uh, get juggled about a little bit and it, and it does get, having been on the coaching side and seeing what happens, it can get really, really messy uh, trying to get a player over the line, uh, especially if there's more than one club wanting that player. So it's frustrating for the supporters, I understand that. And it's always nice, nice to get a few signings in early doors, but it doesn't tend to work like that a lot anymore. It, it, it's it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard scouting. It's a lot of hard graft. But I'm sure Chris Hewton will uh, still have his targets and he'll be working on them. But again, it all boils, boils down to finances as well. So there's players' wages involved. There's transfer fees. There's agents' fees. It's the part of the game that I don't really um, I don't really like. To, like to see it it gets really really messy at times which is a shame but that's just the way the game's gone um what's your involvement in the game stay then you were you, you've worked closely with john sheridan in recent years at, at mm. knots and, and i know you do all charity work now i mean where do you stand with football as it as it is now then it's not without being offered job opportunities uh, i've been offered plenty of work but i decided i lost my job on january the 19th Sec no, sorry, January the 2nd, 2019. First time I've ever been out of the game, 35 years in it. And I decided it was time for me to have a break. Um, wanted to spend a lot more time with the family. i got young kids. So I went into a bit of punditry. I started doing a bit of punditry, which I really, really enjoy. Um, and then you're not involved on a day-to-day -day basis because when you do become a coach, you, you're working between 40, 50 60 hours a week uh, I was never at home so um, I went into doing the after dinner speaking as well which I really enjoy so my involvement in football now is speaking about what I was involved in rather than teaching what, I'm, what I've always been involved in and I really enjoy mixing the time uh, and having time to go and watch football matches I'm hoping to get down and watch Forest quite a bit this season as well because uh, obviously club very very close to my heart uh, but the after dinner circuit now, now COVID seems to be easing a little bit. The after dinner circuit's getting really busy again. Uh, I'm working for Radio Sheffield, covering covering a lot of the Yorkshire clubs uh, commentary, bits of work for Sky. So yeah, a mixed bag really. But I would say I'm kind of semi-retired. I mean, would you get back in then if the right offer came up to get back into coaching? Is it still appeal or not? It, um, never say never, but I'm, I have to admit that at the moment I enjoy the free time. I enjoy working hard when I have to work hard. I, the after dinner speaking, there's there's so much work coming in for it because we haven't been able to have it for the last few years. Um, that I'm really really busy, so my concentration is on that at the moment because I enjoy doing it. I enjoy meeting different people. I love talking about Brian Clough. Um, in fact, I bet people are getting sick of me talking about Brian Clough, to be honest. But no, I, I, I haven't got no aspirations at this moment in time to get back in, no. Um, tell us about walking is brilliant then and what you're doing because you've been the driving force for it initially. Uh, how did it all come about? Well, it came about when I lost my job. I, I struggled um, mentally about not being involved in the day-to-day -day routine. Although I was ready for a break, uh, it, it hit me really, really hard. Um, I had a few uh, personal issues at home. Dad got cancer. There were all little things came on, on top of me at once, and uh, I got a bit lost, to be honest. And um, I got help from the PFA. They were brilliant. They helped, helped me through it. I uh, got got a bit of help. Um, I got a bit of mind training and stuff like that. So I decided that I'd like to get really, really involved in the mental health aspects of general life really so i got in touch with a few ex-footballers who had been quite open and, and spoke about their struggles after football as well so i had a couple of meetings with them and they won't mind me saying the names chris kirkland dean windass nigel jemson john parkin steve howie some really good names there and we decided to form uh, walking's brilliant which is we call ourselves Watch, which is Walking and Talking Charity Heights. So we do, we got a, we started doing a lot of work for charity, and it involved walking because walking for me, when I took it up when I came out of the game, was an absolute game changer for mind, body, and soul. You know, it was really 
for me mentally it was it, it really helped me through uh started off doing a couple of miles up to five miles up to 10 miles every single day um and i found walking and music was really helping me through the tough time that i was going through so we gathered together we formed this charity that we're doing we've raved up raved over fifty thousand pounds and i can't believe that mark crossley has just walked 91 miles in five days from one one side of the country to the other because if you'd have asked me 10 years ago i would never have ever i would have just laughed at you i wasn't the type but it's changed my life walking's changed my life around what did you miss then from the dress from the football uh was it the discipline was it being around the lads i mean you've done it man and boy for i don't know 30 years or whatever what was it that you struggled with after you you left it was more routine um Leave the house six o'clock in the morning, go to work, you're rushing around, you're always wondering, am I going to get there in time? And then everything was everything involved in football is regimental. And I, I loved everything about that. And what it does is it it trains your brain. 30 odd years in the game, it, it's bound to change uh, to train your brain. So you knew what time you were training, you knew what time you had to be there, you knew what time you finished, then you were told what to eat, when to eat it. Then you tell him where you're going to travel, when you're going to travel, why you're going to travel. So everything's, you're told what to do. But when you came out the game, when I came out the game, I was like, wow, I haven't got anybody telling me what to do anymore. Apart from my wife, that is, she tells me. But, uh, but no, I haven't got anything, anybody, I've got no routine in my life, what I'm going to do. And that's when I went into like a dark place because, and then I realised what it was. I realised that, it was, it was the regimental side of football that taught me where I had to be and what time and everything. That um, I was just totally used to routine, and to come out of it was a big shock to the system. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not too shy in speaking about that mentally. It really, really, it really uh, made me struggle. The people you mentioned there. Nigel Jempson, yourself, Dean Windass, quite gregarious, big characters. Mm. Do you think, like, you didn't have an outlet for that when you weren't around the lads then? Was that something that was hard to to be missing? Yeah, the first big change is going from a dressing room full of players and the banter and then going into the, the coaching side where you're in a coach's room with probably between five and ten when you look at, like, all the all the staff that work at a football club, the banter becomes between that ten because what I used to be uh, good at is that I used to be good at liaising between the manager and the players. So I still kind of had that little bit of involvement with the players as well when I went into coaching. Uh, but you have your own little banter section with your manager and your coaching staff, uh, and that went as well. So yeah, it's definitely that. It's definitely that. Um, that day-to-day -day routine that, that that made me me struggle, but uh, we've got a little bit of that back that back now. You know, we have we've got a golf event coming up uh, this week as well. We've got cricket events coming up for the charity. We get together and we all go walking, and we all, I mean, the idea is to get people talking as well. So, and we all share each other's problems and we help each other through them. So, and it seems to be helping a lot a lot of people what we're doing so that that's that's our satisfaction that we're giving a little bit back and it, it takes up a lot of time so it's filled a little gap in my life that has yeah i mean you talk there about sharing problems and you know talking with your mates has football changed in that sense do you think when you were you know playing for forest 20 odd years ago or 30 years ago would you have been able to be that open with your mates is it or is it, is it or has it always been a bit like that no, I think I don't think you would be because if you had problems, I think probably the only you'd be afraid to go to the manager and explain. Listen, I'm not, I'm not, I'm feeling a little bit mentally drained, but you'd be afraid to go to your manager because hey, it's not the manly thing to do, um, and b you'd be you'd be afraid that if you went to the manager uh, and you didn't get the support that you needed, that you'd you'd probably be out the team, and then you've got a battle not only against your own problems, but you've got a battle of trying to get back into the, into the team as well. So it, I know there's loads of people suffered in silence, loads, 
then and there still is now as well. So the idea of us being in the public eye all our lives is to try and not let that happen. Let people see that, you know, we've been in the public eye all our lives and we're not too afraid to speak out about our own issues. And hopefully that'll encourage, well, if they can do it, then I then, then, then I can do it. So, and that's the idea is to get people talking and, um, because it's been a tough time with this COVID as well. That's not helped. I mean, we set up this walking pavilion long before COVID, and then and then COVID struck. So we went from being busy to exceptionally busy, uh, mainly on social media, opening all our, um, opening up to direct messages from people. I mean, I only, I only have to, I'd only have to show you some of the messages that I receive on a daily basis, and you, you wouldn't believe it. But it's good for us because we're encouraging people to talk. You said earlier you couldn't see Mark Crossley walking coast to coast 10 years ago, and now you're planning to walk to up Kilimanjaro, I was reading on your website. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that and um, what you're hoping, when you're hoping to do it and how much you're hoping to raise. Well, we should, we should, have, um, we should have just been finishing Kilimanjaro because uh, that was the original plan. But because of COVID, we couldn't. So we had to find something to do in this country. Hence, the coast to coast. Uh, in the middle of the coast to coast, we did Hadrian's Wall as well, which was an amazing experience. So, yeah, as soon as... We haven't got any dates in place yet, but Kilimanjaro is, um, is the next challenge, I think. Um, I'm told it's not too hard until the last couple of days when the oxygen levels really, really drop. So uh, being asthmatic is probably not probably the right thing to do, but I'll be there, I'll be doing it, uh, and, we, and we will do it, we'll get there. But it, when, I don't know. It'll be sometime in the next couple of years anyway. Um, I'll just read out the website so people can follow it. So it's walkingsbrilliant.com, walking the nest, and then brilliant.com. If people want to follow more about it, where's the best place? Would it be follow you on Twitter or something like that? Yeah, there's myself and any of the lads, myself, Chris Kirkland, Dean Windass. We're all on Twitter. We're all open to it. We've got uh, Twitter. We've got our own. Uh, we're at Walkings Brill on Twitter as well. Uh, but the website will be be updated now that we're back and all the future events and what we're doing, what we're all about. Uh, how we can help people. We, we're about to make some donations in the next few weeks to some small mental health charities to help them as well. That, that's what we're all about. We're not here to just uh, let the funds that we've raised just go missing into something that we don't know where it's going. Our intentions are to distribute to small mental health um, charities to help them be able to speak to people as well and be able to be able to fund what they're trying to do so that's the idea idea behind it um and it's and it's doing well so yeah we've got a couple of donations that we're going to be making shortly uh, in the next few weeks so yeah we're really proud of what we're doing we're at the the sense of achievement after we completed uh course to course has only want us to do more um and the public have been really generous in donating so everyone's a winner so yeah it long may continue and if you stop one person going down you know a dark path just through it that you know you respond to a dm and it helps them and does it kind of make it worthwhile in, in a sense absolutely that's the satisfaction that we get from it um but you know i must stress we're not professionals all we can do is uh if we get asked for help we can t kind of point them, point them in the right direction uh, and we can also share what's what has actually helped us so whether it be music, whether it be walking, whether whether it be daily routine, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's just giving a little bit back to people um, that by us being in the public eye and someone from the from the general public, they can get in touch with us via direct message, and we can't reply to them all because there's that many, but we try our best to reply to every single person. Uh, and that's for me that's what it's all about is is helping people well thanks very much for joining us mark we do appreciate it and we wish you all the best with it and definitely with kilimanjaro when you do get up there i think it probably is hard all the way up not just the last two days but it sounds pretty brutal <laughs> yeah we'll be all right we'll get there we're determined we're determined people so uh, we'll make sure that we do it
Absolutely, absolutely. So thanks very much to everyone who's listened thanks, along man. as ever, and uh, we shall be back this time next week. Thank you for listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for listening. Yeah.